Hey guys, today we're bringing you the first skill cap dueling guide for Classic WoW. For those of you that have just hit level 60 and are looking to get involved in some PvP while we're still in the first phase of Classic WoW's content, dueling is the perfect outlet. Today we'll be taking an in-depth look at one of the most popular matchups of all time, Mage v Rogue. Now, Classic WoW is going to see six phases, with each giving players access to stronger and stronger gear as we progress through them. This will obviously change the dueling landscape over time. Our intention with this guide is for it to be timeless, so we'll be showcasing what this duel will look like in the later phases once players have better gear than what's currently available. With that being said, we've still done our best to make this guide as relevant as possible to where we're at now. If you'd prefer future guides to be more indicative of what duels look like right now, let us know in the comments below. Either way, you'll still be able to learn a ton from this guide and be able to implement a lot of the concepts we cover immediately. Okay, so this guide will be structured in three parts. First, we'll go over a wealth of information you need to have before you even get started with dueling. Then, we'll detail the exact strategy you need to employ in order to dominate every rogue you duel. Finally, we'll provide a detailed analysis of two extremely high-level players duking it out so that you can fully understand how to actually implement the strategies we go over into your own gameplay from start to finish. By the time you're done watching this guide, you'll have a perfect understanding of everything it takes to win this matchup, and we expect that you'll even be able to log in and completely destroy the first rogue you duel, no matter the phase. Right, with all that out of the way, grab some snacks, sit back, relax, and get ready for one of the most detailed WoW guides you've ever seen. So this first section is going to prepare you for the actual duel. If you don't fully understand everything we're about to go over, you'll be setting yourself up for failure, as there's a lot of prep you need to do for PvP in Classic WoW. As the old saying goes, by failing to prepare, you're preparing to fail. Let's get into it. Starting with talents, you want a build that looks something like this. This is a fairly standard build for geared mages looking to get into some PvP. Although, as we're still early in phase 1, a lot of you will be sticking to a more PvE oriented spec for grinding gear and progressing your character. However, you'll eventually want to switch over to a spec like this for PvP. Now, usually when discussing a matchup, most people only focus on the talents for the class they're attempting to teach. This time, however, things are a little different. See, rogues in classic generally alternate between two drastically different builds, one primarily focused on PvE, and the other on PvP. Here on the left, you can see the build most rogues in classic will be running around with while they're still gearing up. This is known as the hemorrhage build. Rogues playing this build will have a sword in their main hand, meaning they can't ambush and will always open with cheap shot. They will also be missing a few vital talents for beating mages. If you face a rogue playing with these talents, which is very likely during phase 1 as they're primarily PvEing and gearing up, you'll probably completely dominate them without any help from this guide. Why? Well, this build on the right is what experienced rogues will use when attempting to duel mages. There's a few crucial talents that completely turn the difficulty of this duel on its head. This build uses improved ambush, improved backstab, and opportunity, which allow a well-played rogue to equip two daggers and completely crush mages with the insane burst damage from opening with ambush and getting backstabs off. Don't be surprised if a rogue kills you in just a few globals with these talents. However, those damaging talents are not the biggest thing here. What's going to cause you the most trouble is improved sprint. This will allow rogues that have all of their cooldowns ready to break out of your roots and snares and stick to you. This makes it incredibly difficult for inexperienced mages to beat a single rogue that has these talents and cooldowns available. Real quick, from here on out, this guide is going to assume you're dueling rogues using daggers and a PvP spec. However, if you are dueling a hammer rogue, you'll still be able to apply the concepts we cover and completely crush any that try to duel you. Okay, next we're going to cover a concept which is vital to your success as a mage in PvP, not only against rogues, but in every situation against every class. First, a talent you'll be picking up called Arctic Reach makes it much easier for you to land Cone of Colds and Frost Knowers on players that are far away from you. Pretty simple stuff, not much going on here, right? Well, not exactly. See, in Classic WoW, there's a hidden mechanic called Leeway. Now what this does is it increases the hitbox of players that are moving. Okay, so why should you care about Leeway if you're a mage? Well, you can abuse Leeway to increase the range of your area of effect abilities when you jump. You can see this in action here, as the first arcane explosion hits from the normal range. The rogue then moves, and the second arcane explosion misses. But when we jump and use arcane explosion from the same spot, it lands. And because of arctic reach, whenever you jump and use cone of cold or frost nova, you're able to hit these abilities from an absolutely ridiculous range. Again, we see cone of cold hit, then miss when the rogue moves back, and hit again when we jump. Alright, moving on. You're a mage that's been leveling on classic well training up your skills every two levels, getting super excited every time you get a new rank or something, 
It's better, faster, stronger. But what if I told you everything you knew was a lie? See, there's plenty of spells you should be using a lower rank of. There's two reasons to do this. One is for mana efficiency, and the other is for the short cast time. Starting with the mana efficiency, you should be exclusively using the rank 1 variant of both Polymorph and Frost Nova. Next, you'll want binds for both the high rank and rank 1 versions of Cone of Cold, Blizzard, and Arcane Explosion. While Cone of Cold deals a lot of damage, it also costs a lot of mana. So, in the early stages of a duel, while you're still trying to gain control over the rogue and burn through their mobility, you want to stick to using rank 1. Once you feel like you're ahead and mana isn't an issue, you can start using max rank Cone of Cold for the higher damage output. Next we've got Blizzard, which will normally be using the max rank of for the damage output in other parts of the game. But when it comes to dueling a rogue, using rank 1 just for a single tip can help you break a rogue's vanish. And finally, we have rank 1 arcane explosion, which, when paired with leeway abuse, is your best tool for breaking rogues out of stealth. Simply running around and jumping while using it will make it incredibly difficult for rogues to open on you without being taken out of stealth. Next, we've got Frostbolt and Fireball, both of which benefit from their low rank alternatives by shortening the cast time. Frostbolt at rank 1 is a great tool for quickly applying a slow from range. Fireball at rank 1 has both a low cast time and applies a 4 second damage over time effect. You won't be using this often, but it's still a good bind to have in case you ever build a ton of distance to maintain the dot while the rogue still has vanish ready. We'll come back to this later. Okay, you've got your talent sorted, you understand leeway, and you've bound some important rank 1 spells. The most important thing left for preparing your character to PvP is professions. You'll want to skill up both first aid and engineering. First aid is fairly straightforward. Once you've skilled it high enough, you'll get access to the most powerful bandages available, runecloth bandages. You'll find that the best time to heal back up with the bandage is whenever you land a polymorph. If you've got someone in a full, non-diminished polymorph, you'll have enough time to channel a full bandage and cast another polymorph before the first one breaks. However, if the polymorph is diminished, you'll need to cancel your channel early, as seen here. Engineering on the other hand is a little more complex. You gain access to a ton of items and gear which can make a big difference in PvP. However, Dueling generally has a gentleman's agreement to ban most of these, so we'll just be covering the most important items that see the most use. Thorium grenades are an extremely powerful tool that, when used properly, can guarantee a stun on your target. There are two good ways to try and land a Thorium grenade on rogues. The first and most common way is to just go for the completed cost as soon as they open on you from stealth while they're on top of you. This will only apply to rogues playing with daggers though, as they'll open with an ambush and not cheap shot. The second, more advanced way is throughout the duel while you're kiting the rogue. When doing this, you'll have the option of fake casting your thorium grenade to try and force the rogue to use cooldowns. This can be seen here as the mage fake casts his grenade twice before the rogue uses vanish to try and stop the stun. And here, we see the rogue sitting in a nova while the mage attempts to cast a thorium grenade. Again, instead of completing the cast, he fakes it, predicting that the rogue will vanish out of the nova to try and avoid the stun. Eventually, when the rogue has no cooldowns, you can go for the completed cast, as we see the rogue stuck in an over here and tanking the stun. Okay, so you've landed your grenade, now what? How can you capitalize on this stun? Well, something we're going to cover in the next section is trinkets, and how rogues cannot PvP trinket out of stuns. This means that if you land your thorium grenade, you're always free to go for a cast. Your options are either casting a polymorph that will burn through their PvP trinket if they still have it, or that they'll be forced to sit in if it's your second polymorph. Also, if you've landed the grenade from a decent range, you can set up a win condition we'll cover later directly off the stun by casting a max rank fireball. Now, rogues can also use a thorium grenade of their own, so it's important for you to know how to counter this. First and foremost, if a rogue is trying to 360 no scope a grenade on you and you want to finish the cast, make sure you have blink ready to break right out of it. Ideally though, you should avoid standing still or moving in a straight line to make it difficult for the rogue to land the grenade. Otherwise, if you won't be able to avoid the grenade, you can absorb the damage with Fire Ward. Try to keep it up throughout the duel, but if it's not up and you see the incoming Thorium Grenade, make sure to use it. Oh, and if you're wondering why you can't see the Thorium Grenade Cospar in your own game, you'll need to grab the add-on Classic Cospars, which adds enemy Cospars to your UI. Another important engineering item which actually shares a cooldown with Thorium Grenades is the Goblin Sapper Charge. This deals AoE damage to everyone around you, including yourself, so again, make sure you've got firewood up to absorb the damage. It also has a couple different uses. Given that it does quite a lot of damage, it can be used to simply chunk your opponent's health if you want the increased damage output. But, more importantly, it can be used as a way to counter a rogue's vanish. See, sappers are off the GCD. 
This means you can use it to break Vanish if you're on global and unable to use another ability to get them out. You can see that in action here, as the rogue instantly uses Vanish on the Frost Nova while the mage is still on global. So, the mage reacts with the sapper to break the Vanish, and again, Fire Ward absorbs all the damage it deals on the mage. The last engineering item we're going to look at is the Gnomish Netomatic Projector. This isn't something you'll be using as a mage, but you can expect some rogues to use it against you. What it does is put you in a route, making you unable to move or jump. This of course means you won't be able to abuse leeway by jumping around while using your abilities. It will also allow rogues to catch up to you and get into melee range. Whenever this happens, you'll need to rotate your camera perfectly to avoid backstabs. This is an incredibly important concept that we're going to cover in detail later on. Now the last thing we're going to talk a little about before we get into the strategy of the duel is gear. There are plenty of BIS lists out there, and we'll have some stuff available in our site soon so you know what pieces to chase for PvP in each phase. For now though, we're going to look at a few offhands and trinkets that can play an important part in this duel. First, let's talk trinkets. Starting with the PvP trinket, which actually won't be available until phase 2. PvP trinkets work a little different in Classic WoW. Instead of it removing every loss of control effect, each class removes specific types of debuffs. As a mage, the only debuff you'll be able to remove from a rogue is their crippling poison. And as for rogues, they'll only be able to get out of your polymorph. This is a key point to the duel as burning through their trinket and landing a second polymorph almost guarantees the win for you. This also means that in phase 1, while no one has access to a PvP trinket, you'll pretty much win every duel against a rogue if you're able to secure a single polymorph. We'll cover this win condition in more detail later. Next, we have the Tidal Charm. This is easily one of the strongest trinkets in Classic WoW and is available right from the start in Phase 1. However, it's incredibly difficult to farm, so don't expect too many players to be running around with this. It's an on-demand stun that you can use to set up a guaranteed polymorph, and that rogues can use to either negate some of your crowd control if timed well, or to just lock you down and deal damage. The last trinket we'll be looking at is the Mind Quickening Gem, or MQG for short. This won't be available until Phase 3, when we gain access to Blackwing Layer. however, when it does come around, it's an incredibly strong tool you can utilise in multiple ways. First, it can allow you to get a polymorph in situations where you otherwise might not be able to. For example, after using Blink, you can easily get a polymorph in time before the rogue reaches you. Most notably though, after you stun rogues with a Thorium Grenade, you can use the MQG to cast a max rank fireball before the stun ends, dealing a ton of damage and setting you up for a quick win. Alternatively, it can even be used to get an extremely quick cast on a rank 1 Frostbolt to apply a slow when both Cone of Cold and Frost Nova are on cooldown. As for offhands, there are two which can make a small difference, the Furbolg Medicine Pouch and the Skull of Impending Doom. The Medicine Pouch gives you a small heal and is much more impactful for the mage than it is for the rogue. The nature of this duel pretty much means that the mage can set up a win condition even if they're on 1 health. It's for that reason that any small bit of health increase you can get has the chance to be the difference between winning or losing this duel. Next, Skull of Impending Doom is an interesting item that players can use to break crowd control on themselves. It works by causing them to take damage, so if it's used just before you land some crowd control on them, it will break. It's also not an issue for rogues to have this equipped in their offhand and swap back to a dagger once they've used it, because most of their damage comes from their main hand. Right, so that sounds pretty OP. Surely there's a way you can deal with this. Well, let me remind you, you're playing a mage, literally the most broken class in Classic WoW. So of course there's a way. Mages can use Detect Magic to see enemy buffs. They're the only class in Classic WoW that can do this, by the way. So count your chickens, because you picked the best class. Oh, and speaking of chickens, the skull actually makes a noise that sounds like a chicken when it's used. So, if you play with game sound on, you can hear when it's used. Anyway, if you think the rogue is using skull, you can fake cast your Thorium Grenade or Polymorph and use Detect Magic to see their buffs. This can bait the skull, and you can then let the rogue take some free damage until they cancel the buff without allowing them to break any CC. Okay, that's everything you need to know before you duel. Now it's time to get into the actual strategy. We're going to be splitting this section up into two parts. First, we'll look at what the game plan should be, and then we'll specify the goals you need to accomplish in order to win this duel. But before all that, this wouldn't be a classic WoW guide if there wasn't at least one element of RNG. From resist to crowd control breaking early, Classic WoW is filled to the brim with RNG, and this matchup is no different. Both rogues and mages bring an element of RNG to this duel that can easily sway the difficulty for both classes in either direction. Starting with rogues, Crippling Poison has a 30% chance to proc whenever they strike with a melee attack. Without a proc, rogues will struggle to maintain uptime on a well-played mage. 
This duel is the perfect example of the rogue having no chance because he gets zero crippling poison procs. And as we already mentioned in the previous action, mages will be looking to use their PvP trinket on this at opportune times. And as for mages, your element of RNG is the talent Frostbite. Getting several of these procs will significantly increase the likelihood that you win this duel. Alright, we're now ready to start delving into the game plan to actually win this duel. For rogues, it's pretty simple. They'll want to rush you down quickly, cycling through their crowd control and mobility to stay on top of you while landing fat ambushes and backstabs. Mages on the other hand have a couple options. They can either stay in and play super aggressive to win quickly, or they can focus on creating distance. With that being said, you'll need to incorporate elements of both strategies depending on how the duel plays out, so it's important that you understand how to execute both. First, we'll look at how to win by staying in. In order to do this, you'll need to combine backpedaling with a ton of instant damage. Yes, you heard right, backpedaling. A lot of pro players over the years have advocated removing this bind altogether, but if you're dueling a rogue that wants to backstab you, backpedaling is the ultimate counter. By keeping the rogue in front of you and perfectly rotating your camera at all times, you can prevent the rogue from using a single backstab. This will force them to use Sinister Strike to build combo points and significantly reduce the damage they deal. There is one downside, however, to continually facing the rogue, and that's Gouge. If a rogue uses Gouge, they'll be able to set up huge damage by putting up exposed armor, moving behind you, and then using backstab. This minigame between avoiding Gouge or backstab is situational and just comes down to how the duel plays out. But you can pretty much follow these guidelines. First, if the rogue starts with Sap, this will put you on Gouge DR. So, focus on backpedaling to avoid backstabs. If they do go for the gouge, it will be diminished and won't be as threatening. And second, if the rogue does get a gouge in the duel, again, just start to focus on backpedaling. They'll only get one backstep out of that gouge, so continuing to give them your back after that would be silly. We can see that mistake being made here, as the mage doesn't focus on backpedaling despite having already been gouged, which lets the rogue easily backstab multiple times to chunk the mage's health down. To simplify it a little more, if you have to choose between tanking a single backstab or a single gouge, just tank the gouge. This will allow the rogue to land the one backstab out of the gouge and you can then avoid the rest with the perfect backpedaling and camera rotation. If you get too fixated on avoiding the gouge, you'll just end up tanking multiple backstabs if you can't get away, so if you have to take one, just let it be the gouge. Right, so now you understand how to stay on top of the rogue without instantly dying, but how do you pressure them? Well, unlike some of the other classes in Classic WoW, Mages, the most broken class, have a ton of instant damaging spells. You've got Cone of Cold, Fire Blast, and Arcane Explosion. Cone of Cold will be used to both control and deal damage to the rogue when using its max rank. Fire Blast does great raw damage and can pretty much be used on cooldown whenever you have a free global to chunk the rogue's health. And finally, Arcane Explosion does good damage and doesn't have a cooldown, but at max rank costs a lot of mana, so avoid using this until you get the rogue low to finish them off. Now, these three damaging spells alone can be enough to win the duel, but there's a few more tricks up your sleeve that if utilized well, can significantly increase your damage output. Shatter is one of the iconic mage mechanics that's been around since Classic WoW, and is still in the game to this day on retail. Using Frostbolt, Cone of Cold, Fire Blast, and even Arcane Explosion on the Rogue whenever they're in a Frost Nova or Frostbite proc will give your spells a increased chance to crit. Landing these consistently throughout the duel will make it much easier to quickly finish off the rogue when staying in their face. Alright, so that's it for your instant damaging spells. But wait! There's more! Wanding and melee swings are an extremely underrated way to increase your damage at no extra cost. You'll mostly be using wanding to finish someone off while you're still on global. Melee swings on the other hand can be weaved in between your globals for some free damage that add up over the course of a duel. But you will need a weapon with a speed below 1.5 seconds for this to work, otherwise you won't get the white hits off in between your globals. So if your weapon speed is fast enough, make sure to do this when employing the backpedal strategy and staying on top of the road. Finally, we've got those engineering items we mentioned earlier. Again, the Goblin Sapper Charge is super straightforward and can just be used for some extra instant burst damage to finish targets off. Alternatively, Thorium Grenades will stun the rogue and let you get a huge cast off if you've got the Mind Quickening gem we talked about in the first section of this guide. But just to reiterate, after you land the grenade, activate your MQG and cast the Fireball, even if you're in their face. You'll apply the Fireball Dot and prevent them from resetting with Vanish or Bandaging Up, allowing you to quickly finish a duel. Okay, that about wraps up the staying in strategy. 
Now, let's talk about the second strategy, creating distance. Your entire focus will be on kiting the rogue while getting through all of their cooldowns to create a win condition. Whenever this happens, some rogues will even just forfeit the duel. This is because once you get through their cooldowns, they have absolutely no way to reach you. You can then either finish the rogue off if they're low, or control the rogue and set up a max rank fireball cast from a large distance into a rank 1 frostbot to slow them, and then max rank frostbot spam while kiting and using instance to guarantee the win. The easiest way to do this is to try and land a thorium grenade straight away so that you can immediately polymorph them. Just make sure to move away from the rogue before casting the polymorph, as they'll be looking to trinket out of it. However, if they don't have a PvP trinket, congratulations, you've pretty much just set yourself up to win the duel. Simply get away from them, cast a max rank fireball into a rank 1 frostbot, and then continue to spam max rank frostbot for the win. If they have any vanishes left, you want to refresh your fireball dot with a rank 1 fireball before it fades to stop them from re-stealthing. However, if they do trinket out of the first polymorph, you'll need to secure a second one to guarantee the win with the fireball into frostbot spam. Also, whenever you have the rogue sitting in a polymorph, if they delay their trinket until they drop combat, they'll be able to trinket and re-stealth. Whenever this happens, Counterspell is the perfect tool to keep them in combat as it's off the GCD. This means you have no excuse to ever let a rogue drop combat when you polymorph them. The next section of this guide will go into extreme detail on how you can actually go about creating distance and burning through the rogue's cooldowns. For now though, we just wanted to make sure you understand exactly what the two different strategies are. And again, as we mentioned at the start of this section, you have to be prepared to swap between the two strategies mid-duel depending on what happens. For example, if you're focused on getting away and trying to land the polymorph, but the rogue manages to gouge you, close the gap and get a backstab, just swap to the other strategy of staying in and backpedal to avoid further backstabs until you either win or can get away again. Alright, so far everything may have seemed relatively straightforward. The two strategies don't seem overly difficult, and we've already touched on the fact that you're playing the most broken class in Classic WoW. Surely you've got this in the bag. Well, unfortunately, this is where things get tricky. We're going to look at the three goals you need to accomplish in order to beat a rogue. These are trading cooldowns, avoiding damage, and playing around positional requirements. We've already touched on some of these concepts throughout the guide so far, but now it's time to fully delve into how hard this duel can be and what it actually takes to win. Honestly, if we wanted to shorten this guide to only have one section, this would be it. Trading cooldowns is by far the most important part of dueling a rogue. See, that win condition we talked about earlier will always present itself once you've burned through all of a rogue's cooldowns. So, there are four sets of cooldowns you'll need to burn through. They're PvP Trinket, two Blinds, two Sprints and Escape Artists if they're a gnome, and two Vanishes. Once they've used them all, if you're still alive and get away, the duel is over. You win. But, this is much easier said than done, as these abilities are what allow the rogue to stick on top of you, lock you down, and kill you very quickly. The key is to always get follow-up control on the rogue as soon as they use a cooldown. This is what we mean by trading cooldowns. They use something, you use something. But you have to be fast, and even hold your global so that you can immediately react to theirs. Not only that, but at times you'll also have to predict their next move in order to effectively counter whatever they do. Starting with the PvP trinket, getting through it is fairly simple. We already said that they can only trinket out of your polymorph, so you'll just need to land one to burn their trinket. Your response to their trinket will either be another polymorph or just standard control from Frost Nova or Cone of Cold, depending on how close they are to you. Next with blind, this will also be fairly straightforward. Most rogues will blind you early on in the duel, usually with their second global to prevent you from gaining any control over them and allowing them to restealth and get another ambush or cheap shot. Luckily for you, Ice Block is the perfect answer to blind. They've got two, so do you. So whenever a rogue uses blind, just trade an Ice Block. The complexity comes with how and when you leave your ice block, and when you use cold snap to get your second ice block ready for their second blind. You'll usually want to sit the ice block for as long as possible to get some important cooldowns back, such as blink, ice barrier, and frost nova. There are however a few reasons to come out early. First, if the rogue starts bandaging, just come out early to stop them from healing up. Second, if you land crowd control on the rogue as they used blind, you want to immediately ice block and cancel it so that you can capitalize on the crowd control you landed. For example, if you get a thorium grenade off as they blind you, you want to quickly get out to follow up the stun with a polymorph. However, if it's a nova or polymorph you landed before getting blinded, you might want to wait a second before coming out early if the rogue is on top of you, in case they use sprint or their pvp trinket as you ice block. This is because if you instantly cancel your ice block while you're still on global, and the rogue uses sprint on a nova or their trinket on a polymorph, they'll be able to use an ability before you can, 
so just be careful. This mistake can be seen here, with the rogue sprinting out of the Nova as the mage instantly cancels their block. This results in the rogue being able to land a gouge before the mage can use an ability. So, if you intend to cancel your ice block quickly because the rogue is in a Nova or polymorphed, just wait for your global cooldown to be over first. In any other case, your goal while sitting in the ice block will simply be to stop the rogue from getting a clean restealth, which will give them a free ambush or cheap shot. It takes plays around 5 to 6 seconds to drop combat, so you'll want to come out of your ice block just before this happens, or react to their restealth and break it before they can use something. Now, you can pretty much always expect a rogue to stay on top of you when you ice block, as they need to stay as close as possible to proc crippling poison when you come out. They can potentially run away and try to reset, but as we mentioned earlier, this doesn't really help them much as you'll create distance and get an opportunity to get them out of stealth by abusing leeway while spamming rank 1 arcane explosion. Right, so you know when to ice block and you know when to come out of ice block, but how do you come out of ice block effectively? Well, you'll want to gain control over the rogue as soon as you come out of the ice block, and jumping while using Frost Nova is by far the best way to do this. First, using Frost Nova means you can face away from the rogue to avoid gouge while jumping away. And second, if the rogue does manage to gouge or kidney shot you as you come out of your block, they'll be stuck in a Nova away from you and forced to use mobility. Unfortunately, you won't always have Frost Nova ready when you get blinded, so you may be forced to go for a Cone of Cold. Good rogues will usually get the gouge if you try to Cone of Cold them while they're close. This can be seen here as even though the mage makes the correct play of waiting for their global to end before coming out of the block, the rogue times his gouge perfectly and gets it off before the mage can use Cone of Cold. Still, there's no harm in practicing being quick with your camera movement to try and Cone of Cold out of the block while also avoiding gouge. Okay, there's just one more thing to mention about Ice Block, and that's when you might want to use it outside of trading it for blind. If the rogue is playing with Tidal Charm and use Blink on a Kidney Shot, they can use Tidal Charm to reconnect and deal a ton of damage, so you may be forced to burn an Ice Block to avoid losing the duel right there and then, depending on the status of your health and shields. You'll likely be forced to sit in a blind afterwards, which the rogue can use to set up a lot of damage, but you'll at least give yourself time to get some important cooldowns back to keep up with the pace of the duel. All right. That's the simple cooldown trading out of the way. Now, things are about to get a lot more complicated. This next set of cooldowns is all about prediction. This is definitely where most mages will go wrong when dueling inexperienced rogues, as you'll need to think fast and act quickly to stay ahead. Getting through sprint and escape artists if they're a gnome shouldn't give you too much trouble. You'll usually force these with a frost nova, but may also force them with a cone of cold if the rogue deems it worthy to remove the snare. You can then respond by following up their sprint or escape artists with more control, usually Frost Nova or Cone of Cold, whichever you haven't used. Vanish on the other hand is a completely different story. The difficulty of this duel pretty much hinges on whether or not you can predict and or react to their vanishes and preventing them from getting additional openers new throughout the duel. One extra cheap shot or ambush can basically be the difference between winning or losing. So you've got four main tools for breaking a rogue's vanish, all of which we talked about earlier. Both Cone of Cold and Frost Nova have the potential to break Vanish and allow you to immediately regain control over the Rogue. However, because of Vanish Purge, you'll only get the Snare or Root effect on the Rogue if you Cone of Cold or Frost Nova more than a second after they vanish. This means you should only try to break Vanish with Cone of Cold or Frost Nova before the Rogue opens if they vanish from a far enough range. And, given that these abilities have a cooldown, Using them too quickly after they vanish would be a waste, as you'll break the vanish but won't get the snare or root effect. It's for this reason that Arcane Explosion, especially when coupled with leeway abuse, is the most reliable and effective way to break a rogue's vanish, as it has no cooldown. Now rank 1 Blizzard, which we mentioned earlier, is another, albeit very situational, tool you can use to break vanish from range if you're able to predict it and start channeling as they use it. And the final tool is the Goblin Sapper Charge, which we also covered earlier. Remember, it can be used while you're on your global cooldown. Just make sure you've got Firewood up to absorb the damage it deals to you. Okay, so you've got your tools to break Vanish, the next step is knowing when you're going to have to use them. In other words, you need to learn how to predict when the rogue is going to use Vanish. Rogues will generally vanish in one of three situations. One, they're snared or rooted. Two, they're about to tank a polymorph. Or three, you're casting a Thorium Grenade. Predicting their vanish on a Cone of Cold or Nova is pretty straightforward, as they're reacting to an ability you've already used. Doing so when you're casting a Polymorph or a Thorium Grenade is a little more tricky. Rogues want to do everything they can to avoid being put into a Thorium Grenade or Polymorph because of everything we talked about earlier. So, if you're casting one that you know will land, be ready to cancel your cast and break the Rogue's vanish. And again, 
You can even channel the first tick of a rank 1 blizzard to get them out in some niche situations if you're expecting the rogue to vanish while they're far away from you. Cancelling your cards to break their vanish is a very standard play that you should be frequently going for when dueling good rogues. There's also a super cool trick you can use to pretty much guarantee you break their vanish if they're close enough to you. While casting Polymorph, you can just spam an area of effect ability that will go off as soon as they vanish. This is because you automatically stop casting the Polymorph when they vanish, allowing you to instantly use an ability to get them out. But again, this will only work if the rogue is close to you, as you'll be trying to break the vanish without jumping and abusing leeway. Okay, before we move on to the next goal, there's one more concept you need to understand which will help improve your cooldown trading, and that's the timing of your cold snap. We already mentioned that you'll need to trade two ice blocks for two blinds, so obviously you'll need to cold snap at some point after the first blind, before the rogue uses their second one. However, you also don't want to waste the opportunity to use additional Con of Colds or Frost Novas, as Cold Snap resets the cooldown on these abilities. So, you'll want to time this well in order to maximize your ability usage throughout the duel. Ideally, you'll use Cold Snap once you've used both Frost Nova and Con of Cold after your first Ice Block. But, you may also want to pay attention to your Ice Barrier cooldown and consider delaying Cold Snap a little further. The only time you should instantly call snap after coming out of ice block is if you already managed to get the rogue super low and expect them to immediately use preparation and use their second blind so that they can recover. Alright, we've got our first goal of trading cooldowns down. Now let's talk about avoiding damage. This goal is 3 pronged with your PvP trinket, blink usage and how you recover when you fall behind all playing a major role in how you avoid damage. We've already discussed that your PvP trinket should be used on crippling poison but when you choose to do this is what will determine whether or not you get value out of your PvP trinket. There are two main scenarios in which you should be looking to drink it. The first is if you've already managed to gain distance from the rogue, usually after a blink. Using your PvP trinket in this scenario will allow you to maintain that distance and prevent the rogue from catching up to you. The second is when the rogue is next to you. If you're able to root, stun or polymorph the rogue to prevent them from reapplying crippling poison, Using your trinket will allow you to turn the tide immediately and create a gap that they can struggle to close. Your blink usage on the other hand is a lot more complex, with the timing, speed and direction and what you do afterwards all contributing to the effectiveness of this cooldown. Starting with the timing, there's a few different situations you can find yourself in that will warrant the use of blink. Using blink at any other time will usually be a mistake and can cost you the duel. The most common way you'll be using blink is to get out of stuns. Starting with Kidney Shot, it can be a little tricky to know whether or not you should blink it, as there's a few things to consider when choosing to do so. First, feel free to use blink on any kidneys that are used towards the end of the duel if you've already burned through some of the rogue's cooldowns. You'll also want to use blink on any high combo point kidneys, which stun you for a long duration. We say this because it can be quite common for rogues to use Kidney Shot with just a couple combo points, so making sure to check how long you're stunned for and then deciding if you want to blink is recommended. We usually suggest sitting kidneys that are only 1-2 to two seconds long towards the start of the duel. You'll also find that they may stun you with kidney while your shields are still up and or while they have very little energy, giving you even more reason to hold onto your blink. So why would you want to hold onto your blink when you get stunned? Well in classic WoW, kidney shot doesn't share a DR with other stuns. That means if you blink out of a kidney and the rogue manages to vanish cheap shot you, or even worse, has a tidal charm trinket they'll get you in a full duration stun after you blink and burst you down. It's for that reason, if you ever get put into a cheap shot or tidal charm stun, you can pretty much always make the trade with blink, as these stuns DR with each other. You'll also want to blink out of any thorium grenade stuns a rogue lands on you, especially if you've got control over them when they stun you. Now, outside of using blink on stuns, you may also find good opportunities to use it to prevent the rogue from reaching you. For example, if you've already built distance and the rogue has no more vanishes, you're free to use blink to maintain or increase that distance and secure the kill. Okay, now that you know when to use blink, it's important to understand why the speed at which you do so is important. If you're slow at using blink when it's required, there's two problems that can occur. First, due to spell batching, rogues can actually use gouge as you blink. This will result in you using your blink but still having to sit in a gouge, which can potentially let the rogue catch up and completely counter your blink. So, you'll need to react super quickly with your blink to prevent the rogue from getting the gouge off in time. The other time you'll need to react quickly with your blink is if the rogue stuns you while getting polymorphed at the same time. If you're slow here, the rogue can trinket out of the polymorph and get lucky with applying crippling poison before you blink. Alright, we now know when to blink and that we have to be quick with it. When it comes to the direction, this should be totally straightforward, right? 
You obviously never want to blink into the rogue, so why are we even bringing the direction up? Well, if you ever get stunned from range with a thorium grenade while you're facing the rogue and you use blink, guess what? You're going to blink right into the rogue's face. This point will only ever be relevant if you're purposefully tanking a thorium grenade cost to finish a cost of your own. All you have to do when tanking a grenade is to make sure to turn your character away from the rogue as the grenade comes in so that you don't blink towards them. The last thing to talk about with blink is what you should do after using it. First, if the rogue is high on health and is slowed or rooted, it's usually good to immediately go for a polymorph cast which you can use to secure the win if they've already trinketed. Just watch out for rogues who are quick to cast a thorium grenade on you as you go for the polymorph. If they're fast, they might catch you before your cast finishes. Although, if you have the Mind Quickening gem, this won't be a problem. Alternatively, if they're low on health, you can either kite to maintain the distance while using instants, or cast a rank 1 frostbolt into max rank frostbolts to get some damage out. However, if the rogue quickly sprints towards you after you blink, you'll need to be ready to regain control over them. And if they have vanish ready, this would be the perfect time to sap with their vanish, as you won't have blink ready to get out of the cheap shot. Okay, great. We covered how you can use your PvP trinket and blink to avoid damage, the last thing to discuss is how you should go about recovering whenever you fall really far behind. So, let's say the rogue has managed to catch you in a stun that you can't break out of and drop you low. Now, don't panic, you're a mage. Immediately, use your ice barrier and medicine pouch if you have it. It's the perfect way to stabilize your health. Then, if you're slowed, you'll need to trade your PvP trinket. Ideally, you'll do this while the rogue is in a nova, but you can also trinket with just a slow on the rogue. Now we did say earlier that you should only trinket if you have full control over the rogue to prevent them from reapplying crippling poison as you move away, but if you really need to recover, you'll just have to take the risk of trinketing even if you've only got a slow on the rogue. And with all that, you should quickly put yourself in a position where you can regain control of the duel. Okay, now our third and final goal, playing around positional requirements. This all comes down to the mini game between avoiding gouge and backstab that we already talked about a little earlier. Now, we'll explain this concept in further detail. Starting with Gouge, there's a few things you need to keep in mind when playing around it. If the rogue starts to duel with Sap or ever manage to get a Gouge mid-duel, stop trying to avoid it and just face the rogue. If they do decide to Gouge you under these conditions, it will be on DR, causing them to use up a ton of energy for little to no benefit as they won't be able to bandage for long or set up big damage with exposed armor in a diminished Gouge. On the flip side, if they did not start with Sap or have not already gouged you and you're able to create distance, you should do everything you can to avoid facing the rogue and tanking gouge, otherwise they'll have the opportunity to either heal up for a while or set up exposed armor and get off a huge backstab. Unfortunately, both Coin of Cold and Fire Blast require you to face your target for them to work. We already talked about this earlier, but just to reiterate, good rogues will usually land the gouge when you go for these abilities. However, you can minimize how often this happens by rotating your character when using these abilities or by only using them when the rogue is out of range to gouge you. On top of avoiding gouge when you're moving away from the rogue, you may also find yourself in a situation where you want to get a cast off while you're in the rogue's face. Kick costs energy, so if the rogue is low on energy or has kick on cooldown, going for a polymorph even if they're on top of you can be a great play. And going for a thorium grenade cast while they're on top of you can also put you ahead. In either case, you'll want to avoid gouge when this is happening by rotating your camera and avoiding facing the rogue. Now, if you're ever slowed and unable to get away, trying to avoid gouge for too long will result in the rogue getting off a ton of backstabs and easily chunking down your health. So whenever this happens, you should instead just let them get the gouge off while you focus entirely on avoiding backstabs. This goes back to the backpedal strategy we covered earlier. Doing this will result in them getting one free backstab out of the gouge, while you continue to avoid any additional backstabs after coming out of the gouge. Alright, that concludes this section on strategy. You now know what it takes to beat rogues, now let's see it in action. Starting with the opener, you'll always want to set yourself up in the exact same way. Make sure you've got your ice armor up and apply your ice barrier, mana shield and firewall buffs. You'll also need to make sure you have a mana gem at hand to get mana back if or when needed. As the duel is about to start, you want to keep strafing around in order to create distance between you and the rogue as soon as they open. If they don't apply crippling poison with their first global and you can control them, you'll instantly create some good distance. If you can time a grenade with their ambush, you'll get a free polymorph. Rogues using the classic cast boss add-on will be able to see your cast, so they'll be trying to avoid it. So keep faking your throwing grenade cast until the rogue opens. You can even start the cast as soon as the rogue opens. Basically your goal here is to stop them from spamming damage and either force an immediate blind or kidney shot to prevent your grenade from going off, 
or even better, to actually get the grenade off and stun them. Finally, depending on what happens in the opener, you'll then need to start building distance or spamming damage. Alright, let's go over a duel from start to finish. This opener here is see the rogue open with ambush as the mage is going for a thorium grenade cast. The rogue is forced to respond to the grenade cast and uses blind as it goes off. We end up with both the mage and rogue sitting in CC at the same time, but of course, the mage makes the optimal play of trading ice block for the blind and goes for a polymorph, making sure to use the time between his ice block global and the start of his polymorph cast to create distance from the rogue. As expected, the rogue trinkets this first polymorph and the mage immediately responds with a frost nova. The rogue then sprints and the mage responds with a cone of cold, which forces the rogue's gnome racial. It's at this point the mage has the perfect opportunity to use cold snap. He's already used his first ice block, and he just used both Frost Nova and Cone of Cold. So, Cold Snap is used, and Cone of Cold is reapplied off the Rogue's Gnome Racial. Also note that because of the distance between the Mage and Rogue, it's safe to go for the Cone of Cold here without the risk of being gouged. But, even so, the Mage is quick to turn towards and away from the Rogue to avoid the potential gouge, just in case. Now, at this point, the Rogue has used one Blind, one Sprint, and his Gnome Racial. If we think back to earlier when we covered the cooldowns that you need to get from the rogue in order to win the duel, they've got the two blinds, two sprints, escape artists if they're a gnome, two vanishes, and their PvP trinket. That means this rogue only has one blind, one sprint, and two vanishes left. It's also important to understand that the rogues need to use preparation to get their second blind, sprint, and vanish back. So, the only cooldown the rogue actually has access to right now is a single vanish, before he uses prep. With that in mind, the mage can predict that the rogue is about to vanish out of this frostbite proc. And so, we see the mage jump towards the rogue, abusing both leeway and arctic reach to frost nova the rogue out of his vanish. Although this play is a little risky, as if you're too quick, the rogue won't get novaed because of vanish purge, but at the very least, the vanish will still break. Now, the rogue is going to use preparation, and the mage will need to get through one more sprint, vanish, and blind. What happens next is a great play from the mage, but only works because he has a mind quickening gem. He uses MQG and pre-casts a rank 1 frostbolt on the rogue as he sprints. Because both Cone of Cold and Frost Nova are on cooldown, this was the only way to quickly apply a slow as the rogue sprints out of the Nova. But despite the slow, the rogue is still able to catch up and land a kidney shot. Now, even though this is only a 2 second kidney shot, we still see the mage use blink. Although we recommend it usually sitting in these short duration kidneys, because the rogue only has one more way to remove slows and roots, the mage is super far ahead in this duel and can afford to play a little aggressive. Out of the blink, Fire Blast is used for some damage, as the rogue goes for a Thorium Grenade. It's placed well and the mage is unable to avoid it, but he makes sure to use his Firewall to absorb all of the damage. The rogue then gets a gouge out of the grenade and uses that time to bandage up and try to recover. Out of the gouge, he goes for a backstab and is finally connected to the mage, without the mage currently having any options to get away. Right, now's a great time to pause and ask what you think should happen next. Do you A. Try to run away from the rogue. B. Use and sit in ice block until your frost nova is ready again. C. Alt F4 and log retail. Or D. None of the above. Hopefully you're on to D. Remember, if the rogue ever gets a gouge on you, start backpedaling. Just avoid giving the rogue your back, and they won't be able to get more backstabs off. Gouge is no longer a threat, so avoiding backstabs is the play. And to that end, we see the mage spend a couple globals making sure to face the rogue, using his ice barrier and then corner of cold as it comes off cooldown, while starting to create distance. This forces the rogue to use his last blind to prevent the mage from getting away, which again is immediately traded with ice block. After a couple seconds, the mage comes out of the block and makes sure to jump while using frost nova, which will keep him out of mana range of the rogue if they stun or gouge, as the nova is used, which is exactly what happens. This forces the rogue to use Vanish, his final cooldown, to break the root and get a big ambush off. But the mage can now blink, trink it out of the slow and cast a rank 1 frostbolt into rank 10 frostbolt spam to win the duel. Alright, so slowing this clip down and talking over it with pauses really doesn't do justice to how fast paced the duel is. So let's play it back at normal speed.
Alright, before we wrap things up, something we haven't mentioned throughout this guide is the free action potion. This is probably one of the biggest counters to mages as it completely negates most of your control. If you're ever up against a rogue making use of a fap, the only real counter is to try and land a full polymorph to create distance. You should expect rogues in open world PvP to use this, but if a rogue ever uses it in a duel, here's an awesome macro you can use. Okay, that about does it for this dueling guide. We'd love to hear if you want to see more guides like this in the near future, and remember to let us know if you prefer to see duels using gear from the later phases of Classic WoW, or if you want to see what duels look like right now with the gear that's currently available. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.